let's get into the balance council tier list guys we've got the top three changes these are changes i love either by fixing a broken card or by making cards that don't get see play like playable and actually like viable and good decks stuff like that uh, we have good changes there's like pretty good um they might not make a huge impact on the meta but something is good for the card neutral changes are things i'm like i don't really care one way or the other on questionable are changes that i'm not sure about yet but i think might be bad bad changes are ones i'm sure will be bad and pancakes is what i called the bottom tier because these things just get flipped over and over like when you mess up your pancakes which i have definitely not done recently definitely not anyway as far as the cards here um i debated pulling each one up but I think for this, we'll just go through them real quick, make the tier list pretty quick. So we have AL the Ancestors here. Uh, let me just make sure we're going in order of the, the categories. All right, let's begin with the provisions increased here. Let's try and make this pretty quick, just go through the cards. I won't bring up the cards at this time like I did in the tier list videos. And uh, important announcement here, guys. If you guys want to see the end of season summary, I'm going to include those together in this one video. So we're going to have the first part will be the balance council. The second part will be the end of season summary for my games last season. I think this will make a lot more sense because it'll give context to the nerfs and buffs and changes. Maybe when you go see the nerfs and changes and go look at what I played against, a lot of it will make sense. Because a lot of times I reference things I played against or what I saw a lot higher levels in these videos with the tiers. So now it'll be a lot easier to just go to the next part at the end and see those decks like how they performed. And what I ran into. And I think I'll also talk about decks I played this season too. So we'll change that up. If you're interested, make sure to check that out. But for now, right into the tiers here, we have a Dead Eye Ambush change. I don't really care. Uh, Dead Eye Ambush is just annoying. It's like waylays is mostly what it does. Although if this would help Elf Swarm, like pure Elf Swarm, that's kind of, I like that. But waylays and heists and stuff has really fallen off. So I don't really like buffing leaders, but I mean, this leader doesn't really get much play outside of pure traps and stuff. That's not great. Eternal Clips getting provision is good. Uh, Cultus is just a really obnoxious deck to play against. You usually win or lose the game either at the start of the match or after you draw your cards and don't have a heat wave, and it's just obnoxious. The fact this is a top tier, like pretty competitive deck was really annoying. And then the fact that you guys maybe played it last season was a. Uh, I played that one up a little bit, I'll admit. <laughs> it was annoying, but when I record, I generally like, don't care too much about what's going on. Ale the Ancestors. I think this is good. Ale's a card that's just gained value over time. People realize there's how much value is in this. It's a resilience engine. And Shoop Soldiers is a super strong deck. Now that's what we played to our peak Nilfgaard this season. Then we have Morvood getting a provision. I think this is probably good. Uh, Fruits, is, Fruits is still going to be a super strong deck. It seems like they don't have too many nerfs in here. And honestly, the version I played had no nerfs. So we're definitely playing that next season. Well, we got one point. On a card we'll get to later, but that's it. Which is Sabbath. I'm just pointing this here because I hate Witch's Sabbath. Like, the decks, it's kind of the same thing Cultus. If you don't have an answer, you just leave the game. It's just really annoying, and they're just a bunch of nonsense going on. Um, Yeah, just a bunch of nonsense. Uh, this isn't really going to make a big difference, though. They're still going to play it. It's just going to be less consistent. But yeah, I think these two go up there. Next up, we have Magic Compass. This is probably good. Compass just generates, let's be real, you're only ever generating, like, a Small Blood or a Fakusha. Or like a niche combi or a heart of terror, depending on the situation. And combi one is <laughs> combi's hilarious. We had some combi ones last season. But yeah, uh, this is just generating so much for what it does, and also thins your deck if you're playing a deck that plays it early. And there's also the decks where you just play this round one, two, and three with a uh, lippy. So you know, a lot of value there. With the cleaver nerf, this is a nerf to the crime deck. Um, cleaver is pretty strong. This is one of the nerfs I'm least excited about, but I think making sense of how good Crimes and Syndicate was last season. Syndicate's pretty much always the best faction, just because it has the highest skill ceiling most of the time. So I think this is probably a good one. Golden Necker, I don't really care one way or the other. I didn't see too much Golden Necker last season. It is incredibly powerful, but I didn't see it that much outside of exactly Golden Necker Witchers. But this does hurt all the other Golden Necker decks, which I'm not a big fan of, but there's not much else you could do there. Rating Fleet, I'm also kind of neutral on. This is a hit to Pirates. It's a hit to the Ockelt Compass deck uh with the what's it called uh phrase blessings which i finally tried <laughs> and uh, yeah this is just whatever it's a provision that hurts the deck uh those decks were pretty good i think i'll leave it in good for now next up we have one i really could care less about this is going to be a provision nerf to blue stripes commandos the idea here is to go back to five power once it's at six provisions but if you make it five for five people just revert it so it's four to six and then it'll be five for six we'll see if it actually gets there just putting it here for now and I'm going to actually say my last say on these pancake cards in this video. I should probably not, hopefully not have to talk about again. Renfrey is just obnoxious, and all the Renfrey ducks are the same, so I don't really like playing against them. They're really boring, and she is probably the most powerful unit, arguably, in the game. And I don't see why we are buffing her back. I think she should be the 15, whatever. Ardle. 
I love this one. Ardle's super cool. Great card to have as a tech option in your cards here, or in uh, Assimilate, for example. And in case you haven't noticed here, we're now on to the um, provision decreases. So Ardle's an 11. This is also a provision decrease. So we got the 10 buffs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Or the 10 nerfs, and now we're on to the 10 provision buffs. And I think Ardell's really cool. It's a really great option. It was just a little too expensive. The value you get on it really depends on the tactics. I like him being an option in the tactics deck. I think that's great. Nextly up, we have... Uh, this is a provision decrease. So this actually helps. Um, I really like this. This is one I'm a big fan of. I think Devotion Symbiosis should, Devotion Symbiosis should be contender with non-devotion symbiosis you should be able to play both but ethne just doesn't give you that like she's the devotion payoff for symbiosis and it's nowhere good as close to as good as getting the double um equinoxes right so i like this buff i prefer devotion much more than the non-devotion symbiosis and hopefully it's gonna get some play and even non-devotion you can run the second form if you want to uh and yon calway here i don't think there's any amount of power slash provisions you could give yon calway up to like until he's like 12 or like a four power card that people won't play him for the consistency because it's the most consistent most consistent card in the entire game it makes Nilfgaard the most consistent faction in the entire game and honestly this thing's seven for ten i mean buffing this thing again i don't want to see it alzer is a cool change though i really love this one so alzer with the uh six revision card oh, why can't i remember its name right now orb of insight with the orb of insight combo it's a really neat combo it's a card that really should... I used to see a lot of play in that deck. A deck got power craft and now it doesn't. Owls are now cheaper. You can do Golden Necker with the... um, What's it called? I just said it. Or Orb of Insight. And to be honest, we have played up to like 25-something before Prism Pendant Golden Necker, which we'll probably be, revi probably be revisiting with this. Everyone tells me Prism Pendant is trash. It is not trash. Prism Pendant is actually pretty good in the right deck. Then we have Geralt R. This is a good change. I don't think it'll make too much of a difference. He's going to play 10 for 8 with 3 movement, which is actually approaching decent value. And if you have a deck that can take advantage of that in archetype, so say traps that already have a row effect, row damage effect in them, maybe you'll consider it. Maybe you can make a movement deck with this. It's kind of a nice change. I don't think we'll see it too often, but this is definitely the worst of the Geralt cards. So getting it, see, getting it buffed is quite nice. Same thing here for Horn. Horn is one of the most fun cards in the game to have playable. Because it gives both players a lot of thought process and mind games, right? You Is that a horn he's playing? Do I need to consider it before I pass? It's going to get eight points. And then for you, you're like, well, maybe I'll set up the horn here. And maybe they'll pass. Maybe they won't. And it just makes a lot of fun mind games. A super interesting card. I'd love to see this buffed. Uh, Fav, I've said my stuff about the provisions tutoring cards. I They're not going to stop buffing them, but... Uh, this is going to make our Devotion Squiatel deck, <laughs> which we played a lot this season, even better. Boris is a... So I'm just going to put that neutral. Uh, Boris is one that's pretty good. As you can see now, we are into the uh, additional, still provision decreases here. I think this is the... No, we got one more. Got one more after Boris. So Boris is a card that... It's just so specific. It's kind of... It's just really hard to use. Like, you kind of have to build your deck around Boris... Or you have to have Boris be cheap enough that you can include it. If it doesn't pay off, you don't really care as much. So I think they went for the cheaper approach. We'll see if this makes a difference. I'm not sure it will. Uh, so I'm just going to leave up here for now. Slave Driver is a terrible one. Uh, Slave Driver it should be six provisions. It's spawning copies of stuff. The soldiers have deploy effects. They have armor. So being a one power copy doesn't make a difference. You have Nausicaa's. I mean, it just should be a six power card. Six provision card because of all the others. Like It should be like uh, Reaver Scouts. It's... This is just obnoxious whenever it goes back to five, and that's the final sign of this. Uh, Frank's in it, isn't it? I, I really love this. Another buff to the devotion up here. Uh, the thing with this, though, is it kind of helps in situations where you don't want to leader him. Because you don't leader him, it takes a long time to get him back, right? But if you do leader him, he's already getting buffed up past five. Uh, but now it gets him out of six damage range on this. So this is a really cool change. I want to see some symbiosis getting back in the action here. Preferably devotion. Caesar, I think Caesar definitely needed a buff. Someone asked me about this Caesar Dex last time. Uh, a power buff. As you can see, I'll see we are in the power buff section with the Frex in it and Caesar. Plus one power on these guys. It's just, I'm not sure he'll have the value to make that deck viable yet. I'm going to leave him down here in neutral. I like the change, but I don't think it's making much of a difference. I do like the change, though. I'll kind of put that up here. Yeah, yeah, we'll go with that one. Sarah, another good one. Of the Letho Sarah. 
and um, Ox combo. Ox is like fine, six for six lock. It's bad because it's Nilfgaard and they have the soldiers, so you need to pay them off. Sarah and Letho are you pay them off. Sarah being the weaker of the ones. And now that Sarah gets a power buff, it makes him play for a little bit more. Just more value on top of his control. Um, I don't know if that, I don't think the trio will still see play, but hopefully this helps out a little bit because I do like seeing those guys. Eggman going straight to top tier. Uh, this is a, the Veil engine. All I think all the factions pretty much got a seven provision engine that has like some effect, passive, and then something when you click the order, like uh, Parian Phantom, stuff like that. One power on him. I hopefully hopefully he sees play. I really enjoy some of these alternative Northern Realms cards because those standard ones just kind of get boring all the time, like Immortals and things. Like the, every deck plays Immortals, no one plays anything else really. Now we have Mork Farg getting a power. I think this is a good one. There's a good amount of Mork Farg. Like decks in general. Or there used to be a good amount of Morkfarg in decks, like with Darren, with Shoop, Shoop Lippy, um, just with Lippy Compass, Lippy like, with the sword, so they just recycle all the Delirium, like recycle all the Echo cards. Um, so I think this is a nice change. You don't see him too much, in, even in discard anymore. So I do like this. Thoughts like a sergeant going straight to pancakes. You know, I just think saying pancake tier is funny. <laughs> That's why I changed the name. But uh, yeah, um, this one gets getting swapped back and forth. Honestly, I think it's fine at three power, and it's also kind of fine at four power. I think also, I think the slave driver is the problem. Uh, I think three, like sure, is probably technically more fair, but I don't hate it at four either. Like I think the it really should be like I don't know somewhere in between or something, but you can't do that. So I'm kind of fine with this at three or four, and uh, it's just like point slim. Either one's good in my opinion. So, but the fact this changes every council is obnoxious. Whisperer, we're gonna stick up by our friend here. Alzer. Uh, Alzer and Whisper now can go into your deck with Golden Necker. Al the Whisper went from uh, three to four powers as a two step process because it got buffed, then reverted, then nerfed so it could get buffed again. And now we're here with it, and I think this is a really cool change. I want to see this thing get played. I want to see the decks with the Golden Necker and Alzer. I want to see that archetype get playable again. So hopefully this helps it out. Ravian Pikeman's a good change. This guy does get to reduce your cooldown with the Death Blow or the Inspired, I believe. It's just like an, a nice, interesting soldier to synergize with the engines, the Siege engines. I'm not sure it'll get played still, but I'm going to probably try it out because it is interesting at 5 because you actually have a little bit more value there. Next up, Vico Vero Novice. Uh, this is a really good change too. I don't think I'm going to put this one top tier, but this is for the Hyperthin decks. You kind of have to play Vico Vero Novice in them if you're playing Albrick. Now, I would like it if the non Albrecht versions were competitive as well, but I think that would have to, like, you'd have to, like, buff, buff, um, maybe Imperial Golem again. I don't know. But yeah, this is an interesting one because you have to play it in the decks to trigger the Albrecht. And each time you do it, it's a six or four, and you don't like playing six or four. So it's like the cards you put back in your deck most of the time. A good change. Herrick Marine. This is another good one, in my opinion. The Devotion cards should have really big payoffs, right? Like we saw with Oak Critters getting buffed, Devotions, Goyatel really can do a lot of work with that because it's such a good value on the four version card for devotion that this is a card that the northern realms can use in their devotion decks um, i really like it i don't know if, if it'll have a ton of impact northern realms does already like to play devotion so it's not like hard for them to slot this in i think we will put it up here i like it i like the change quite a bit i think this will see a lot of play i do like that we have angular fish this is a one per power nerf that's just going to go into a four provision uh, uh, before provisions the next patch i believe is the theory here whatever same type of thing it's a two-step one i'll grade it when it's done uh we have bernacle brawler going back into pancakes this thing has changed all the time too um at five power i did i mean it was five for five that did one for one spending one for one spending is not great unless you're damaging killing stuff uh, but you do have stuff like the uh the open sesame that gives you a bunch of coins you can kill off stuff I don't really care, like four or five. I personally think I like it at five potentially, but I think both. It'll it's just gonna keep swapping back and forth. It's really annoying to play against what does all the damage, but it isn't in, it is an inefficient spender. So it's kind of matchup dependent. If you're like developing engines, it really is annoying. If you're playing point slam, it's not that big a deal. Then we have Fallen Knight. Hey, look at this top tier. Every time Fallen Knight got buffed, except maybe the last time when I said it looks like this is gonna happen no matter what, we'll just accept that. Oh yeah, Fallen Knight's just the most obnoxious thing. Fallen Knight. Crime spam was just so it was really good and really strong and very annoying because the fall of night like five they just have to trigger like a one they have to have out a cleric who spawns a guy they just use one leader charge if they're playing fire sworn fire sworn I don't really care about it. it's great in fire sworn but the problem with this is at five power if they just click the order on the four person cleric and spawn a token then all of a sudden boom you can't really remove this with anything and it's already got veil 
Illusionist, our top tier change. Illusionist is just an obnoxious four version bronze. Uh, it has, I think, one of the highest highest ceilings of all the four version cards in the game. Outside of like a giant spores. But I mean, it's just so... Sure, you get a one power token, but there's so many ways to make copies of this, especially with Slave Driver. Um, I mean, there's, so, there's artifacts to make copies. There's just cards that are really great if you just take, and then you put, like, I don't know, you take a Witch, a witch Apprentice, and then it starts boosting itself, stuff like that. Immortals, I think this is also really good, uh, as much as it does pain me a little bit. Immortals just dominates the mid-range, like, mid-value slot in Northern Realms too much. Every deck just, like, Immortals Sorceress, remove the Immortals Shield, get the points. Like, there's not much variety in Northern Realms because of that. Like, every deck's just running this, so I think nerfing it probably makes sense. I don't know how much of a difference it'll make. I'll just leave it here. So Living Armor here is losing a power. This is part of the, um, what's it called? The strategy to nerf cards that the nerfs don't affect. To block unnecessary nerfs from other people. I have spoken about this before. I don't really like this approach, but it seems like it's the approach that will be taken. And as such, I'm probably not going to talk about it anymore and just stick them down here in whatever. Because that looks like that's what's going to be happening. So we'll just have to deal with it. Then we have Lord Riptide. Um, 9 for 9 instead of 10 for 9. Lord Riptide is a very, very powerful card. I don't think it's getting removed from Monsters decks <laughs> after this. It is super common. It is everywhere in Monsters. Is that because it's amazing or because Monsters has no other choices? Probably a bit of both. The higher you get on the ladder, the less good Lord Riptide is. People just play around it too much. But to be fair, if they are playing around it, they're already like playing disadvantageously, so it's probably warranted. And besides, Fruits is like another super annoying, the most common deck we played this season. Roach getting a power nerf. Um, I'm going to stick this up here too. I'll stick this up here. Um, nine provisions, sure, whatever, for Golden Necker and stuff, but Roach and Nickers and things like that, uh, Musicians of Blaviken, it's fine in my opinion that they're like thinning tools. It's just really obnoxious and they provide so much tempo that they're just like tempo slamming. And a lot of decks use Roach at this point. I'm going to leave Roach in good. I don't think I feel as strongly about that as I do these ones. Build Carl is going to be the same thing as Living Armor here. I'm just going to stick this in neutral because it's also actually a buff to the card. If you're in self wound, you have to hit it with one leader now, which is kind of nice. And then Junior, uh, I think we'll stick right here. Junior was a very powerful card for Devotion uh, Syndicate especially like the crime decks and stuff. But I think with the Cleaver and stuff, this and Fallen Knights, we didn't really have to nerf this. Fallen Knights really being the problem card, then Cleaver also like was super strong. And that will be it for the tier list. Do we really have nothing in questionable or bad? Am I just being too positive today? Am I just be too positive? Let me look over the second here. Yep, 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 yep. I mean... I don't think this is neutral. I don't think that's going to make a difference at the moment. I think it needs another buff. Uh, I don't feel like any of these are actually terrible. Just the reversions. Like, these are all, I think, fair. This is a terrible reversion, terrible reversion, terrible reversion, terrible reversion, reversion, whatever. I guess, okay. That'll be the Balance Council tier list. Uh, I'm super positive about this one, actually. I didn't realize it. I didn't go through and think about these cards ahead of time. I just took the real quick one and got the pictures from the website. And uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, I should be excited about this. Let's see how it goes. But on to the next part here, we'll go check out the September season summary. Uh, I played more games this season at a higher MMR, so we'll see what we got here. And I actually made some additions. So if you're interested in this season summary, let's go get on with it here. So faction distribution, where we always start this thing. Uh, we will go right up off the bat here with our distribution so we play like 230 games i think and we have 24 percent monsters 24 23.7 nilf guard the first time nilf guard has not been the most popular faction and they got a whole bunch of buffs so that's going to change next patch but monsters at 24 percent it's because fruits was everywhere the fruit stacks because i don't know why we buffed the fruits leader when it was already a good like meta deck but this is what happens there was skeleton at 17 northern realms Scoitel. Syndical, pretty similar down here, 11%, 12%, whatever. But yeah, this is pretty common. Mostly, mil actually not that common. We have most monsters for once, which uh, should tell you something. Nilfgaard is going to change back because we have a bunch of buffs, but this isn't too surprising to me. 
yeah, this makes like makes decent sense. Again, these are all very uncommon. Scorthel and Northern Realms here. I think Scorthel is actually super strong. It's just the Devotion deck with Shiru. And then we've got Northern Realms. Not having much variety, actually. Kind of sad. Speaking of variety, let's go check out the decks by faction. And we made a couple changes here, so this should be an improvement. So these are the most popular monsters decks. What I did this time, if you see some numbers on here, is we took all the decks the same as before. I just I debated between combining stuff like Blaze of Glory Raid Warriors and Patch of Fury Raid Warriors. Raid Warriors. I decided not to in the end, just because of how difficult it was. I don't want to keep downloading APIs, but uh, for uh, combining stuff, combining rows and whatever, it's messing up my formulas. But anyway, so what we did here is we have the same number. This is number of games, just like always. The decks. And what I added here, these are the MMR variations. So the average MMR of a game I played this season, should be down here somewhere, is 2452. So the average MMR we played is 2452. This is how much above or below that on average the deck was. Uh, I debated making its own chart about this, but I think this makes the most sense here. So we can see if a deck's not common. If it was like an outlier, like we made maybe play like two, like 2410 or something, it'll be easier to see. But anyway, the most popular deck in Monsters I saw was the just standard fruits. Minus seven, so it means it's pretty close to my average MMR games. And it's just super strong, just a whole bunch of point slam. You got a couple engines, you got huge finishers, you got some control. Uh, just very annoying to deal with because it's so good at what it does. Next up, we've got Frost. I think Frost is pretty fair. As you can see here, we play this one a little higher up on average. It's pretty decent. Uh, Frost, I think, is like a good example of a balanced deck. Pretty fun both ways. And then we've got Tatterwing, Ogroids. And um, yeah, Tatterwing and Ogroids. And then we have a little bit down here, like these minus ones. Like these are ones you can kind of see. We only played them a couple times. Vi a couple times. No unit hyper control death wave. This is like the um, Scorch, Heat Wave, Muzzle, like all the control cards. And then they play like a K Rin and eat everything, eat like three death wish units at the end. Got the Mortar Harpies. Really strong deck. Didn't see it too often though. We got the Tugo, which is Sabbath, which is Sabbath Unseen Elders. I can. There's like eight different Unseen Elder, or eight different Witches Sabbath decks. I just didn't feel like combining them. But yeah, this is the Monsters. Makes sense. I remember playing tons of Fruits this season. For Nilfgaard, we've got most popular is Enslave Assimilate, which will be back even more, I'm pretty sure, next season. And then we've got some Henry Shoop Assimilate. Really strong deck there. You can kind of see the numbers here. I'm not going to talk about the numbers for each one. I'll just mention one if it's particularly high in the ladder. I saw it most of the time. Or particularly low, like the Witches Sabbath ones are all pretty low there, like minus 23, minus 30 from our average. So this is like 24.15 on average. We saw that Vi deck. So we've got the uh, Enslave Assimilate. We saw Henry Shoop Assimilate. And then Shoop Enslave Assimilate. Uh, so just just different leaders here. The Henry Shoop Assimilate here is with Double Cross. And then we have Shoop Soldiers. Well, actually, above that we have Statuses, Cultists, and Mill. Um, there were two Mill decks. One we saw three times, and one we saw four times. Uh, this is just only showing up the one here because they're different leaders. And I think I accidentally messed that up on this chart and I don't feel like fixing it. But there was another mill deck we saw. No, we saw we saw it with three different leaders. So there's two, two, and one. Two, two, one, one. And this chart only shows the ones we played more than twice. So this one's didn't. Yeah. In case you were curious, which we saw at exactly the average of 2452. As far as the rest of this, we've got Clog, Renfrey. I mean, you could tell it. The Nilfgaard was so annoying this season. Like the Enslaved decks, are, these are fine, these ones. But then we have Statuses, Cultists, Mill, Clog. It was just such an annoying... <laughs> just playing against Nilfgaard in general, super annoying this season. And you see, we saw Renfrey, like just spam Ren Renfrey decks. There's a couple different ones. Uh, there are a couple different ones of these too. Different leaders, but a lot of the leaders had like one person playing it. So they add up to more than this. And we have some Shoop Enslaved Soldiers and Shoop Soldiers. So Soup, shoulder, Soup Soldiers was the one I encountered the most at the high level this is like 2490 ish mmr on average and that's just a really strong deck this has like um the ale in it the uh, war council the mushy truffle for carryover and then you play the shoop and then you just carry over the shoop and whatever we played similar deck we played this deck i think for northern realms really not much going on in northern realms this season we saw a bunch of golden necker witchers makes sense some literally traveling priestess a couple temple dem events and a few reavers yeah, so this is what we saw for Northern Realms this season. Nothing too much to talk about here. Not too much Northern Realms at the high level, in my games at least. A couple of Golden Necker Witchers were, but a couple were really low too, so it sort of averaged out. And we have these guys. For Skellige, the most popular deck was Raid Warriors and Pirates. Uh, yeah, so we have two Raid Warriors on here. These are two different leaders for the Raid Warriors. 
you add them up, you get to like, uh, what is this? 11. This one's Blaze of Glory, and this one's Patch Title Fury. We have Plain Pirates, so, you know, Pirates, Onslaught Pirates. Couple Ot Quad Blessings, Shoot Blippy, Swords Compass. So this means we saw this on average like a 24, it was super high in the ladder too. We only saw two of it. I think it was the same person playing the deck. And this is where you compass round one, two, and three, because you thin your deck so much, then you like get all the echo cards back round three. You get Arendite, Hengath Sword, Delirium, all that stuff. Then a couple self wounds this season, which you love to see. Overall, uh, nothing super oppressive here. I mean, the Raid Warriors are really annoying because they just do their thing. And, and if you don't have Point Slam, you kind of lose. And then, like, the Pirate deck's annoying. There are some annoying decks here. Now, on to Scoia'tael. So, for this, we've got um, Harmony. Harmony, we saw an average really close to, like, just the beginning of the season uh, at the high level. Devotion Midrange. This is the deck I played this season, which we'll talk about later. And super highly performing deck, very competitive, and just got buffed because you got a buff to FOB, which we'll be, we'll be playing around with. So this is really cool. Uh, this deck is super strong. It doesn't really do anything other than just like play value cards. I mean, I play water in mine for uh, a little bit of engines, but overall this deck's just pretty solid. Gold Necker hand buff, Symbiosis, a couple other ones. Ran free precision strike control and dwarves. Surprisingly, uh, I think there was a shoop dwarves in here, and I forgot to separate it separated out. But dwarves and ran free precision strike control, pretty popular. Not so much dragons this season. You can kind of see like the, the devotion mirror is really dominant were the ones I saw at the higher end. Now for syndicate, no surprise here for anybody. We have fallen knights crimes, fourteen times the most popular one by far. Just look at the rest of this. Like three Fire Sworn, three Acarantia. These are pretty high up on the ladder. Uh, another Acarantia. So this is the one with line pockets. This is the one with off the books. So six of them total. Should probably keep the leader charges on there, but I changed the formulas to try and make these a little cleaner. And plain crimes collusion. This is not with Pirates Cove. This is just also with line pockets. So overall, the most popular decks of the season I saw were Fruits, Fallen Knights, and Slave Assimilate, Pirates. Uh, Raid Warriors passes both of those. You add them together. Frost, Henry, Shoop Assimilate, Golden Necker, Witchers, Statuses, Cultists, Traveling Priestess, Dwarves, and Friend Free Precision Strike Control. Probably not too much of a surprise there if you played a lot this season. Uh, some of these decks are quite annoying, though, like Statuses, Cultists, you know. But anyway, on to the leaders. So for this season, we've got the leaders. We have 20 Fruits of Yisgith. What do you know? Every single person who played... Fruits was playing Yurt of Yisketh and no one else was. And then as far as the rest, we have White Frost. Uh, see how it got nine carapaces here? This is just a bunch of nonsense. This is the Ogroids and a bunch of the Witch's Sabbath decks. Overwhelming Hunger, Deathwish, Witch's Sabbath decks. Arachisworms, Tatterwing. And then we've got Force of Nature. Those are Renfree. Harpies, Renfree. And Koshe, that kind of stuff. Then we have Blood Scent, Couple Vampires. These are, I think all of these were Witch's Sabbath... Um, yeah, which is Sabbath Unseen Elder decks. And yeah, so that's what we got for monsters. Not too much of a surprise here. A decent amount of variety, but Fruits obviously overperforming. Or more popular, I should say. Northern Realms, we've Inspired Zeal, the most common, then Shield Wall, then Pinsir. Uh, Pinsir being the literally decks. As far as the rest, a um, few mobilizations. This is all Reavers. A couple stockpile sieges. But no Royal Inspiration, no Knights. I really thought I saw Knights this season, but I guess that was just the season before. And Knights I didn't play a single Knight deck this season. That's really weird. I don't think I did. I, 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 I thought I did, but thinking back on the videos, I don't think I did. So this is interesting. I'm not sure what's up with Knights here. Is it just not popular this season? I mean, Northern Realms of Giant wasn't too popular, I guess. It was just dominated by the Witchers. For the Scoia Tell here, Gorilla Tactics, Precision Strike, and Mahakam Forge all tied. So some good variety. Um, we played Gorilla Tactics mainly. Call of Harmony and Nature's Gift also kind of popular. Then only one Dead Eye Ambush, a couple Invigorates. So Scoia Tell, there weren't too many games for Scoia Tell, Northern Realms, and Syndicate. So I kind of expect this. But uh, speaking of expecting that, we'll go on to Skellige here. A little more variety than normal, which is great. We've got a bunch of Patricidal Fury, a bunch of Onslaught. A bunch of Reckless Flurry. The Reckless Flurry. So for Blaze of for Raid Warriors, there's Reckless Flurry Raid Warriors. A couple of those are in here. A couple Blaze of Glory Raid Warriors and a couple Patrick's Fidal Fury. So like a lot of these are the same deck, just spread out between different leaders, which is interesting at least. 
couple Rage of the Sea for the Renfrey Beast, some Earthside Ritual for Self Wound, and not a single Battle Trance. So I don't think that's going to change considering Druids just got nerfed via the ALD Ancestors. And I don't think we're going to see much Druids in Battle Trance <laughs> for a while. On to Nilfgaard leaders. We take a look here. We've got a good spread. Enslave, Popular, Tactile Decision, Double Cross, Tide, and then we got Imprisonment, Imposter, Information, and Toussaintoy Hospitality. This is actually a pretty good spread. Nothing too surprising here. Uh, just pretty interesting overall. Tactical Decision was a little more played than I thought it would be after seeing the Mage Assassin nerf, but, you know, it's still pretty decent, I guess. And just remember, like, Mill, and there's a lot of Mill in here, a lot of Clog in here, which do like those. So that's what we got here. Pretty good spread, though, I'd say. What doesn't have a good spread is uh, as we get invaded by the cats. Hello, kitten. One second. All right, we're, we're, we're good. <laughs> I had the door closed, but not all the way closed, so she just pushed her head through. All right, so we've got uh, the most popular syndicate leaders here. Which, if we take a look, I mean, this is not going to surprise any of you who played a lot this season. Not at all. Line pockets at 17. They've got off the books. Hidden Cash, Congregation, Pirate's Cove at like minimal use and no blood money, no jackpot. Obviously, this is a problem. Uh, how much of this is line pockets being the best leader and how much is, it, is it the fires or the Fall Night deck playing line pockets? I don't know, but this is problematic. Like obviously line pockets is way overrepresented here, but we'll see if it changes with the Fallen Knights nerf and Cleaver nerf. So overall, the most popular leaders, if we take a look here, are Fruits of Isgith, Line Pockets, Patricidal Fury, and Slave, Onslaught, Scission, Double Cross, Caraguist Imprisonment, Overwhelming Hunger, Frost, and Zeal. So a lot of monsters, a lot of Nilfgaard, the most popular factions, no surprise. And we've got Line Pockets just sticking up here for its, um, just everyone spamming out the Line Pockets deck with the Fallen Knights. Not too surprising, I guess. Moving on to deck type, this one's like, I don't know if we're going to keep this one in here, but it's kind of interesting, so I don't think this one changes much. We've got 31%, 32% mid-range, 24% combo. A lot of combo going on this season. Uh, stuff like Cultus, I consider a combo because if it goes off, you pretty much win. Stuff like that. Uh, Reavers aren't actually, they're not really a combo deck. They're an engine deck. I don't count them as combo. But you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. Uh, Kelp, Compasses, a lot of combo decks. A lot of one of combo, a lot of one of combo decks that just like populate a lot of these. Good amount of engine, good amount of control. Point Slam. Uh, I think I put... The fruits under mid range, otherwise, this would be much higher because it is more of a mid range deck. Most of them play a ton of control in it. Well, not a ton, but a lot of control, so I wouldn't consider it just point slam. Maybe you could, though. And on to the last section neutral packages. Uh, well, it happened, guys. Renfrey got a one provision nerf, and 20% of the decks we played against stopped being Renfrey. Does one provision matter that much to the Renfrey decks? I guess it must. I guess it must be that one provision nerf. Makes a 80% decrease in the use rate of Enfrey, Renfrey. Interesting, to say the least. Got a good number of Shoop, like 3 or 4%, not that high. Uh, but to be fair, though, these Shoop decks were very high in the ladder. These are the ones we saw like right around like 2400 or 2500, a little above it. I think we peaked like 25. <laughs> we did the thing where we ended the season at all of our peak MMRs, which is not what you're supposed to do, but whatever. And then we got Golden Necker, Bombs, Construct, Dragons. Not much of these at the moment. I'm not sure we can. Something should be done about that, but that's what we got. So if we scroll down for the last thing, we've got the devotion. So we've got 69%, 70% devotion, 30 or non-devotion, 30% devotion. This is much better than it used to be. In the beginning of the season, I mostly saw devotion, and then it's like switched around as the season went on. But yeah, that is the season summary. Only one thing left to do, guys. Your favorite part. Let's go check out the emote spammers and disconnectors. What do we got? For disconnectors, we played a Ogroid player. I'm pretty sure I heatwaved his King Trum and he left. Uh, we've got a double cross Henry Shoop. I don't remember him disconnecting, just did. And then we've got an Onslaught Pirate player. Not too surprising, there's a lot of those. And then if we look at the emote spammers, we had a good number of them this season. Good number. Uh, let's look. Huh. Two Ren Free Assimilate, uh, two of the three Ren Free Assimilate players we played against were emote spammers. Two of the Henry Shoop Assimilate players we played were emote spammers. Look at this Nilfgaard emote spamming, who knew? And Slave Assimilate emote spammed on us. I don't, 
put you on the emote spam list, by the way, if you like emote a few times throughout the match, because like, that's kind of fun. If you're emoting every 10 seconds, you're going on here. <laughs> that's like what's going on here. Uh, who else emote spammed? Uh, Temple Dem event player. I don't remember what happened there. Two of the Melitally decks. Yeah. The most annoying decks are the ones tending to emote spam at me, in my experience. And then we've got one down here, Fallen Knight's Crimes. Who got mad. I think we did a Lilith's Omen on him and he couldn't answer it. Like, didn't have his Fallen... He didn't have any Fallen Knights, I think, is what it was. He didn't have any Fallen Knights, then he just lost. So that is it for this season, guys. Uh, this is the season summary. The last thing here, I'm going to revisit one thing. We did, we did this before. I'm going to throw it back in. We're going to go to the Gwent data website. If you want to take a look at your laddering, if you're in the top 2,500 or so, go take a look at the Gwent data. You can see the leaderboard of players and such. Like, you can go say, um, here's the top 2,500 pro rank. Let's go, like, top by country. I'm in the U.S., so you can, like, sort by country. U.S. Yeah, there we are. Click on your name or search your name. So this season, we finished 199 on the ladder, 99.60. Uh, honestly, I just stopped playing this Galaga. It was our fourth faction, and we, like, I guess that we ended at a peak MMR for most of our factions, or right next to it. We just stopped playing Galaga. And let's see, so overall, we had 227 games, a 60% win rate, 63 of their top factions. 60% is pretty good, I think, for most laddering. Uh, you kind of see what we played here. Scoyatel at 75%, basically, was by far our highest win rate faction. Just Devotion, Symbi or Devotion, Scoyatel, Midrange, which we'll be playing again next season. 65% with Monsters, 64, I mean. That was the Lilith's Omen deck. 58% Nilfgaard, that was Shoop Soldiers. Skelgar, we tried a bit of Akel and the Blessings. Syndicate, we didn't, I don't even think we got 25 games with. And Northern Realms is way down here because I was trying to, I don't know if you're watching this. Whoever requested the Sorceress of the Lodge lore deck, we played as many Sorceresses as possible. This one's on you. <laughs> we tried to play all sorts, all the Lodge Sorceresses with like Sabrina and everything into one deck. And Kira, it doesn't fit super well together. So we just dropped a whole bunch of games in a row trying to make that work. And then we didn't make a video on it because it couldn't get to work. But maybe next season. We'll, we'll see. That's what happened with Northern Realms, if any of you are curious. As far as play rate by the factions, we played mostly Lilith's Omen. I, I thought Lilith's Omen is a really fun deck. They played Devotion. A lot of Devotion at mid-range. I love my Great Oaks. And then some Nilfgaard, Silga. You can kind of see here. And yeah. So with all this thrown here, you can kind of see we peaked our MMR on the last day. And we just didn't play enough games really to finish it out. Like we peaked our MMR. We're like at 25.35 on like monsters and like Skellige is like 24.50 because I just stopped playing Skellige at some point. But yeah, stuff like that. So we did pretty well this season overall. You can see our win rate down here by factions. I thought I'd throw this in here. Most of our high MMR games we played with either Devotion, uh, Skoyatel, or with a little Omen. But you know, that's how it was this season. I will probably do updated versions of those decks next season. I don't usually do updated versions, but I think maybe going forward, if the decks don't get nerfed, I'll share like my laddering decks. Maybe just do a quick update on them for videos. Let me know if you guys like that or not. And hopefully you enjoyed. This is the season summary. We did the tier list. Let me know if you like these together. I think it makes a lot of sense to put them together. That way I don't have to make two videos like right after each other, right when the patch comes out, when I could instead just be doing like a new deck the next day or something. So let me know. And also let me know if you what do you think about the balance council itself. I think this one actually looks pretty, pretty really good. We got some stuff to try out here, that's for sure. And we will see you in the next one. Hopefully you had a lot of fun.